I was out to dinner with some friends last night. In fact, I should have been writing the script, but that's writer's disease, I'm afraid. About 90% of your time is wasted on totally pointless and distracting activity, and only about 10% is actually spent dreaming up and composing and shaping and honing all those wonderful, exciting, soul-stirring excuses for not having got anything written. Here's a Python sketch which hardly illustrates that point at all. And now it's time for novel writing, which today comes from the West Country, from Dorset. Hello and welcome to Dorchester, where a very good crowd has turned out to watch local boy Thomas Hardy write his new novel, The Return of the Native, on this very pleasant July morning. This will be his 11th novel and the 5th of the very popular Wessex novels. And here he comes! Here comes Hardy, walking out toward his desk. He looks confident, he looks relaxed, very much the man in form, as he acknowledges this very good-natured bank holiday crowd. And the crowd goes quiet now as Hardy settles himself down at the desk, body straight, shoulders relaxed, pen held lightly but firmly in the right hand. He dips the pen in the ink and he's off! It's the first word, but it's not a word! Oh no, it's a doodle way up on the top of the left-hand margin. It's a piece of meaningless scribble and he signed his name underneath it. Oh dear, what a disappointing start. But he's off again and here he goes, the first word of Thomas Hardy's new novel at 10.35 on this very lovely morning. It's three letters, it's the definite article and it's the Dennis. Well, this is true to form, no surprises there. He started five of his 11 novels to date with a definite article. We've had two of them with it. There's been one but, two ats, one on and a Dolores. Though that, of course, was never published. I'm sorry to interrupt you there, Dennis, but he's crossed it out. Thomas Hardy here on the first day of his new novel has crossed out the only word he's written so far, and he's gazing off into space. Oh, oh dear, he's signed his name again. It looks like Tessa de Durbervilles all over again. But he's, no, he's down again and writing, Dennis. He's written V again, he's crossed it out again, and he's written A. And there's a second word coming up straight away, and it's Sat. A Sat, doesn't make sense. A Sat, A Saturday. It's a Saturday, and the crowd are loving it. They're really enjoying this novel. And it's afternoon, a Saturday afternoon, it's called the beginning, and he's straight on to the next word. It's in, a Saturday afternoon, in, 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 no, November. November's about wrong. He's left out the second E, but he's not going back. It looks as though he's going for the sentence. And it's the first verb coming up, it's the first verb of the novel, and it's was, and the crowd are going wild. A Saturday afternoon in November was, and a long word here, apro, apro, is it approval? No, it's approaching, approaching. A Saturday afternoon in November was approaching, and he's done the definite article, but again. And he's writing fluently, easily, with flowing strokes of the pen, as he comes up to the middle of this first sentence. And with this 11th novel well underway, and the prospects of a good day's writing ahead, back to the studio. That was the Python team featuring Michael Palin on lead vocal and Graham Chapman on rhythm jokes. It's from the album Monty Python's Matching Tie and Handkerchief, which I think is their funniest album, only I'm not allowed to say so. This point was made to me last night when I was out to dinner, uh, rather than getting the script written. As soon as you tell anybody that something is amazingly, fantastically funny, which is what I said I was going to do because I thought I could get that up for half an hour, it inevitably falls flat. So I've modified my approach. There is only one really amazingly, fantastically funny thing on the show, and that is just so unbelievably funny that I'm going to play something else in the meantime just to build up the tension. So apart from this one thing which is going to be incredibly funny, the rest of the show is going to be more or less devoted to sex and violence. Now, of those two, sex, I think, is the most popular, largely because you don't have to get up for it. So we'll keep that for later as well and crack straight on into the violence. Here's a story of horror and cruelty from Woody Allen. I was kidnapped once. I was standing in front of my schoolyard and a black sedan pulls up and two guys get out and they say to me, do I want to go away with them to a land where everybody is fairies and elves? I could have all the comic books I want, and chocolate, and wax lips, you know. <laughs> and I said yes, you know. And I got into the car with them, because I figured, you know, what the hell, I uh, was home that weekend from college anyhow. You know. <laughs> <laughs> they drive me off, and they send a ransom note to my parents. And my father has bad reading habits. So he gets into bed at night with the ransom note. And he read half of it, you know. And he got drowsy and fell asleep. <laughs> then he lent it out, you know. Meanwhile, they take me to New Jersey, bound and gagged. And my parents finally realize that I'm kidnapped. 
and they snap into action immediately. They rent out my room. <laughs> the ransom note says for my father to leave $1,000 in a hollow tree in New Jersey. He has no trouble raising $1,000 but he gets a hernia carrying the hollow tree. <laughs> the FBI surround the house. Throw the kid out, they say. Give us your guns and come out with your hands up. The kidnappers say, we'll throw the kid out, but let us keep our guns and get to our car. The FBI says, Throw the kid out. We'll let you get to your car, but give us your guns. The kidnappers say, we'll throw the kid out. And let us keep our guns. We don't have to get to our car. <laughs> the FBI says, keep the kid. <laughs> The FBI decides to lob in tear gas, but they don't have tear gas. So several of the agents put on the death scene from Camille. <laughs> tear stricken, my abductors give themselves up. They're sentenced to 15 years on a chain gang, and they escape, 12 of them chained together at the ankle, getting by the guards posing as an immense charm bracelet. And here's another one. Years ago, my mother gave me a bullet. <laughs> bullet. And I put it in my breast pocket. And two years after that, I was walking down the street when a berserk evangelist <laughs> heaved the Gideon Bible out a hotel room window hitting me in the chest. The Bible would have gone through my heart if it wasn't for the bullet. Well, saves changing the record. Now, again, I'm not going to tell you anything about how funny the next item is because it's, it's clearly not nearly as funny as this real boffo we've got coming at the end. In fact, it's not really intended to be particularly funny and I'm only putting it in because I think it's wonderful. It's a passage from Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to read it myself. Any fanatical Vonnegut admirers such as myself who hear this are going to be outraged, but this situation has been forced on us. According to copyright restrictions, we can only broadcast a minute of it. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to read it terribly fast because I don't have to miss any out. I may have to do it in two 30-second chunks with a pause or a lemon slice halfway through. Now, the situation, just to explain, is that the hero, Billy Pilgrim, has come unstuck in time and is for some reason having to live his life in a totally random order. At one point, he turns on the television to watch a war movie, and since he comes unstuck at that moment, he is forced to watch the movie backwards. This is how it goes. American planes full of holes and wounded men took off backwards from an airfield in England. Over France, a few German fighter planes flew at them backwards, sucked bullets and shell fragments from some of the planes and crewmen. The formation flew backwards over a German city that was in flames. The bombers opened their bomb bay doors, exerted a miraculous magnetism which shrunk the fires, gathered them into cylindrical steel containers, and lifted them into the bellies of the planes. Over France, German fighters came up again, made everything and everybody as good as new. When the bombers got back to their base, the steel cylinders were taken from the racks and shipped back to America, where factories were operating night and day, dismantling the cylinders, separating the dangerous contents into minerals. Touchingly, it was mainly women who did this work. The minerals were then shipped to specialists in remote areas. It was their business to put them into the ground, to hide them cleverly, so they would never hurt anybody ever again. The American flyers turned in their uniforms, became high school kids, and Hitler turned into a baby, Billy Pilgrim supposed. That wasn't in the movie, Billy was extrapolating. Everybody turned into a baby, and all humanity, without exception, conspired biologically to produce two perfect people named Adam and Eve, he supposed. Oh, lemon. Hi lemon. there, nice to be with you. Happy you could stick around. Like to introduce Legs Larry Smith, drums. And Sam Spoon's rhythm pole. And Vern Dudley Bohay Noel, bass guitar. And Neil Innes, piano. Come in, Rodney Slater on the saxophone. With Roger Ruskin Spear on tenor sax. 
Hi, Vivian Stanchel, trumpet. Big hello to Big John Wayne, xylophone. And Robert Morley, guitar. Billy Butlin, spoons. And looking very relaxed, Adolf Hitler on vibes. Nice. Princess Anne on sousaphone. Introducing Liberace clarinet. With Ghana Ted Armstrong on vocals. Lord Snooty and his pals tap dancing. In the groove with Harold Wilson violin. Franklin McCormack on harmonica. Over there, Eric Clapton, ukulele. Hi, Eric. On my left, Sir Kenneth Park, bass sax. Great honor, sir. He's specially flown in for us, a Sessions Gorilla on Vox Humana. Nice to see Incredible Shrinking Man on Euphonium. Drop out with Peter Scott on Duck Call. Gary from you later, Casanova on horn. Yeah, digging General De Gaulle on accordion. Really wild, General. Thank you, sir. Roy Rogers on trigger. Tune in Wild Man of Borneo on bongos. Count Basie Orchestra on triangle. Thank you. Great to hear the Rawlinsons on trombone. Back from his recent operation, Dan Drop, hot. And representing the flower people, Quasimodo on bells. Wonderful to hear Brainiac on banjo. We welcome Baldunicum as himself. Very appealing, Max Jaffer. Mmm, that's nice, Max. What a team, Zebra Kid and Horace Bachelor on percussion. And a great favorite and a wonderful performer, all of us here, J. Arthur Rank on Gong. The Bonzo Dog Band introducing themselves, which is why I didn't bother. So, this is just to remind you that there is a staggeringly funny item still to come. Here's a tiny bit of it, just to whet your appetite. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, it breaks me up. Anyway, more of that later. In the meantime, we've got a lot more violence to come, but first, sex. Come in here, Margaret, would you please? Here. You've been ferreting around in my sandwich box, haven't you? I certainly have, and I found something not altogether connected with sandwiches. <laughs> I refer, of course, to Blauwetter's Encyclopedia of Sexual Knowledge. <laughs> How do you explain this? I, I, I found it on the heath, Pete, and uh, I thought I'd better keep it in my sandwich to keep it dry. You know, until someone claimed it. You'll be hardy away, aren't you, because you're ashamed of it? No, I haven't. I just kept it out for safekeeping. You shouldn't be ashamed of sex, Dad. It's no good hiding your sex away in your sandwich tin. <laughs> that won't do any good. Bring it out in the open. Yeah. It's a good book, though. Some good bits in it. Have you read any of it? I've, uh, yes, I've uh, been through it up to page 3001. <laughs> Well, you've read the whole lot then, haven't you? Yes, it's quite good, isn't it? I like it, because it tells you everything about sex from the world go, doesn't it? Well, I it's mean... a wonderful thing about a sexual moray throughout yeah. the ages, Doug. But who is your sort of ideal woman, Pete? Well, above all others, I covet the elfin beauty. Mm. The gazelle slim elfin beauty. Very slim, very slender, yeah. but all the same, still being endowed with a certain amount of... Uh, Busty substances. <laughs> yes, a kind of uh, Audrey Hepburn with Jane Mansfield overtone. <laughs> I go for. Yeah. Well, what do you like? Me too. The same sort of thing. But actually, I like the sort of woman who throws herself on you and tears your clothes off with rancid sensuality. <laughs> Yes, they're quite good, aren't they? I think you're referring to rampant sensuality. Well, either one will do. But, uh, of course, the important thing is that they tear your clothes off. Yes, that's the chief thing, mm. whether it's rampant. I like a good rampant woman. Yeah, right? well, I'll tell you, a rampant woman or rancid, whichever you prefer. That was Veronica Pilbrow. Oh, remember goodness, her? yes, I remember I her. Remember I remember her, her yeah. yeah. I, she always used to 
for our cell phone, Roger Braintree. Never me, though. Yeah, well, Roger Braintree at school, he always knew much more than everyone else, didn't he? He's always boasting about the things he knew much more than anyone oh, else. Oh, clever drawers, wasn't he? Eh? Yeah. <laughs> Remember that time he come round behind the wooden buildings? Yeah. And he had, what was his name? Kenny, Ken Kenny Fair. Kenny Fair with him. And yeah. he come up and told me, he said, I've discovered the most disgusting word in the world. It's so filthy that no one's allowed to see it except bishops. And nobody knows what it means. What? It's the worst word in the world. What was the word? Well, he wouldn't tell me. I had to give him half a pound of peppermint before he let it out. Do you know what it was? What? Bastard. <laughs> What's, what's that mean, Pete? Well, he wouldn't tell me, so I... Uh, <laughs> I knew it was filthy, but I didn't know how to use it. Uh, so uh, he said the only place I could see it was down at the town hall in the enormous dictionary. They have, they have the enormous one with a whole volume to each letter. And uh, you can only get in with a medical certificate. <laughs> so I went down there and sneaked in you know, very secretively, and went up and I took down from the shelf this enormous, great, dusty bee and uh, <laughs> brought it down and opened it up and there was the word, in all its horror, what? bastard. What, 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 what was the definition, Pete? It said, bastard, child born out of wedlock. Yeah. <laughs> what's, what, what's a wedlock, Pete? I, uh, Wedlock, Dad, is a horrible thing. It's a mixture of a steam engine and a padlock. <laughs> and uh, some children are born out of them instead of the normal way. And it's the filthiest word in the world, Dad. Uh, make your hair drop out of your Oh, you see that? Yeah. Peter Cook and Dudley Moore doing one of their broadcastable routines. I had a friend at university who used to collect rude words, and he claimed actually to have discovered the rudest word in the English language. And it's a word which I've subsequently used quite often in the scripts I've written for the BBC, and it's always got through, simply because no one knows what it means. We tried it out on the BBC reference library earlier this week, and they didn't know what it meant, so we decided it's safe to say it. The rudest word in the English language is... Win it. If all you heard there was a beep, then it means that someone somewhere in the BBC has found out what it means and put a stop to it. There will now be a short, embarrassed pause. Actually, the most embarrassing thing that ever happened to me was nothing to do with sex. No, no, it's not quite true. No, the second most embarrassing thing that ever happened to me was nothing to do with sex. And um, that happened a few years ago when I was waiting for a train. I'd arrived at the station about 20 minutes early because I'd misread the timetable. Um, or, no, British Rail had misread the timetable. Um, so I was there 20 minutes before the train arrived, and I went along to the newsagent to get um, a newspaper to do the crossword to kill time. And I went along with the newspaper to the buffet. And I bought myself um, a cup of coffee and a packet of biscuits. And I went and sat down at the table. And sitting opposite me at the table was this perfectly ordinary-looking man, wearing a business suit and a tie um, uh, and a briefcase. And I sat opposite him, and I had on my left-hand side the newspaper folded at the crossword, on the right-hand side a cup of coffee, and in the middle of the table was the packet of biscuits. And I took a sip of coffee, and I looked at the paper. And as I was doing so, the man sitting opposite me leant across picked up the packet of biscuits, tore it open, took out a biscuit, and ate it. Now, this is the sort of thing the English are actually terribly bad at coping with. Um, I and mean, what do you say to a man who's just stolen a biscuit? Do you work out how much the biscuit costs and ask him for that amount of money? Or, I mean, well, how do you cope with it? Um, I didn't. I just totally ignored it and took a sip of coffee and uh, stared at the crossword, and then I took a biscuit myself and ate it and just tried to pretend that the packet hadn't already been opened. And... He did it again. He leant across, opened the packet again, took out another biscuit and ate it. Ah, and having not said anything the first time, it was even more difficult to try and say anything the second time. So again, I stared furiously at the crossword, couldn't do a single clue, and um, took another biscuit myself. And for a moment our eyes met, and we looked away in embarrassment, and uh, he took another biscuit. And we went on like this. He took a biscuit, I took a biscuit, he took a biscuit, I went a biscuit. We went through the whole packet. Well, I say the whole packet, there were only eight biscuits, but it seemed like a lifetime. And when we got through the whole packet, he stood up and left. And I sat back and breathed a sigh of relief, because this had been torment. And a few moments later, my train was announced, 
So I finished my cup of coffee, stood up, picked up the newspaper, and underneath the newspaper were my biscuits. The interesting thing about this, you see, is that there is a man, maybe he's an accountant, he looked like an accountant, wandering around the country, presumably telling exactly the same story, except that he hasn't got the punchline. Anyway, here's something um, which also doesn't have a punchline. Um, There's really just one gag which goes on and on and on and on. Nobody knows the origin of it. It's a tape which I believe was made by an American disc jockey X numbers of years ago, just with the aid of a trumpet player and an effects disc, which purports to be the story of Gunga Dim. I won't tell you anything more about it. I'll just play it to you and see what you think. The legend of Gunga Dim. Let us recreate that moment. With the enemy waiting in ambush, the humble water boy sees his beloved comrade rapidly approaching the deadly trap. He realizes fully well that sounding the bugle to warn them might mean certain death. Undaunted and oblivious to consequence, he bravely raises the bugle to his mouth and... you and flayed you by the living God that made you. You're a better man than I am, Gunga Din. Well, I warned you about the punchline. Anyway, one of the tricky things about doing programs such as these is, of course, trying to find convincing links between different items. You know this sort of thing. Well, so much for goldfish. Since we're on the subject of fish, the government's new housing bill is a very different kettle of fish. We have in the studio, etc., etc. Anyway, the BBC technical boffins have come up with a new device for providing links by computer. You simply feed in the last line of one item, the first line of the next. The computer will rifle through its memory banks for a merry quip, which will move us deftly and convincingly from one to the other in less than 5.7 seconds. So I'm going to try it out. So there'll be a little technical fiddling here. Um, Gunga Din in here. John Cleese monologue here. Program cross-digital feed, adjust multi-semantic interface, and voila. Well, ha, 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 that was that, and this is this. Oh, God. Tonight's the night I shall be talking about a flu, the subject of word association football. 
Uh, this is a technique out of living, much used in the practice mix perfect of psychoanalysis, and brother, and one that has occupied Piper the majority rule of my attention squad by the right number one, two, three, for the last five years to the memory. It is quite remarkable, Baker Charlie, how much the Miller's son, this so-called while you were out word association immigrants problems, influences the manner from heaven in which we sleek it car and timorous beasties all Americans speak, the famous explorer. And the really well that is surprising partner in crime is that a lot in his wife of the lion's feeding time, we may be CDE effectively quite unaware of the fact or fiction section of the Watford Public Library that we are even doing it. It's a far, far better thing that I do now then, now then, what's going on with Christian Barra, the famous hearty part of the lettuce now praise famous mental homes for loonies like me. So on the button, my contention causing all my headaches is that unless we take into account of Monte Cristo in our thinking, George V, this phenomenon, on the other hand, we shall not be able, satisfact or fiction section of the Watford Public Library generally to understand with attention when I'm talking to you and stop laughing about human nature, man's psychological makeup, some story the wife will believe, and hence the very meaning of life itself, which bastard I'll kick him in the balls pond road. Well, this is the moment you've all been waiting for. This is the, and here I quote, real boffo, the amazingly, fantastically funny, unbelievably funny, incredibly funny uh, bit, which I sort of mentioned earlier. Um, it's a song. It's, uh, it's by Bob Dylan. Here it is. I reached up, touched my shirt, and the neighbor said, are those clothes yours? I said, some of them, not all of them. He said, you always help out around here with the chores. I said, sometime, not all the time. Then my neighbor, he blew his nose. Just as Papa yelled outside, Mama wants you to go back in the house and bring them clothes. Me and then I shut all the doors. Oh, God. Uh, I should have listened. I mean, they said, they said to me at dinner last night, do not build up the expectation. Don't say it's funny. Because that's, that's very funny. I mean, it's very funny. I shouldn't have told you it was funny to begin with, because now you probably don't think it is. Well, it makes me laugh. Thank God for Python. We interrupt this sketch to take you straight back to novel writing from Dorchester and the latest news about that opening sentence. Well, the noise you can hear is because Hardy has just completed his first sentence and it's a real cracker. Just listen to this. A Saturday afternoon in November was approaching the time of twilight and the vast track of unenclosed wild known as Egdon Heath embrowned itself moment by moment. And that's after only three hours of writing. What a hardy ass cracker. Hitchhiking his way around his sense of humour this week was Douglas Adams. Next week, It Makes Me Laugh will be presented by John Ebden. <laughs>